a very special podcast today then with a man that has been in the self-defense and combatives industry for a very long time. It's the one and only Lee Morrison. So prepare maybe to have a few feathers ruffled in the martial arts world, but that's exactly what we want. Lee, thank you so much for coming on, mate. Great, mate. Thanks for having me on. That's fine. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, living the dream, as they say. Fantastic. Cool. <laughs> what I want to do then today is talk about real violence because right. this is something that you've experienced throughout your life. And you're someone to kind of um what's the word? Call bullshit when calling bullshit oh, is well, necessary. Yeah, necessary, yeah. Yeah. Well, I just say things as they are, you know. I don't intentionally want to rush them. Those feathers, but if people are, you know, so sensitive that they can't handle it, then well, fuck them, basically. <laughs> yeah. I I'll say it as I see it. <laughs> For sure, yeah, yeah definitely. So speaking of real world violence, then you were introduced to it from quite an early age compared yeah, to very much. early. Yeah. So how yeah. did that all start for you? Well, okay, so I I was born in South East London, 1968, um, to a single mum who didn't have a home of our own. She used to do this states registered nursing, living in housekeeping type job. Right. And so we moved around a lot, and she was of a very um, uh, unpredictable kind of personality she couldn't keep a job down for long she was quite neurotic my mum and we'd move around a lot and this involved me as a youngster going from school to school to school to school where we always being the new kid and always being a little bit different to the others and getting bullied yeah. so I experienced it at, um, at school at an early age and then but unfortunately I experienced it at home so uh, I cut a long story short I left home and school when I was 12 and was a street kid in in London. Right. So obviously there was a catalyst for that in my home life. So, you know, really the, the one that should have been looking after me the most, allowed the most, um, you know, uh, abuse and violation to occur, if you like. So when I leave this career, I'm, I've been working on a book for a while, which has taken a turn now. And it was actually called back then, like a path to a peaceful warrior. Uh, you know, it's badly the, the, how you see developed and the philosophy behind it, etc. Yeah. And so, obviously, since all of this business, this, this took a massive U turn, particularly we were talking earlier before you introduced me about, you know, I really have had an awakening of a sense. So, that's gone in the book as well. But the, um, when I wrote about, when I started writing this book, I'm very candid in it. So rather than give you any sort of details of my upbringing here, I'm going to leave it leave it for that book. But needless to say, I grew up in a, I was in an aggressive, violent environment that was very unpredictable. So you know, I, I would be left alone for a significant period of time, and then two o'clock in the morning, I'd hear the door slam. Right. And already then, I was developing that uh, sensory acuity that was saying to me, "Was that the wind, or is she drunk again?" Do you know what I mean? And, and, and a six-year-old kid full of adrenaline. So I experienced what it was like to be fearful and, and be on as a very as a youngster. Uh, around about that time, year before I left home, I started karate. I started um, traditional karate. That's all that was around at the time. And my catalyst for that was, I'll tell you this. So um, being in that kind of upbringing, I had no siblings. I have brothers. My mum had been married four times before, none of which was my dad. She's like yes. kids to all of them. And it was that kind of wacky period. But my um, upbringing was really just me and her moving around a lot, people asking a lot of questions, me being quite introvert, not really mixing with the lads and being a bit of an outcast. So I went through that. And around 11 years old, I, I was sat on a bus once, London bus upstairs, and I found a copy of this poster magazine then that was called Pung Fu Monthly okay. and it was all about Bruce Lee that's what it was about and I just saw this figure that just depicted this is the story for many people many people have been influenced by yeah. Bruce Lee that he, he looked like the kind of person that was having a better fucking life than I was you know <laughs> and if I had my life we would be able to do something about it that kind of idea so it sparked my interest and looking around uh, all there was at the time was traditional Japanese uh, karate, judo, and aikido. There was no JKD. There was no salat. There was fuck all. That's it. So I just immersed into that. And so from the age of eleven, I started training, and I've never stopped. So all through all chaotic periods of my life, I trained. 
I trained, I trained, I trained. And over the you know, decades, I trained in everything from Japanese, Okinawan, Chinese, uh, Filipino, Indonesian, Western influenced, uh, military influenced, et cetera, et cetera. And I never ever stopped training and cross training. But my main education for violence was the street. Yeah. I left um, you know, home to school. I, was, I went originally, that's where all runaways go, and ended up in the West End of London, and then ended up living in a squat in the East End, where I used to rob to eat. And by the time I was literally there five months, I was involved in gangs. And then from a period of um, about 15 onward till about 21, I was involved in football violence. Yeah. And met my first wife when I was 17. She kind of put me more on a straight and narrow. But all of this period of time, I'd never stopped training in everything. But my real education was the street. So I was fighting in arcades. I was fighting in the street. I was fighting in clubs. I was fighting on terraces. I was fighting a lot. And I knew that real violence that I had grown up around and seen and witnessed a lot and partook in was nothing like fucking martial arts make out. Yeah. Martial arts, because for some reason I just felt if I was doing that, it was almost like I wasn't a thug. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I, was, I was a street kid. I was like, what can I say? I used to do did what I needed to do to get by. But what this taught me as an education, rubbing shoulders with people like that, is what real predatory behaviour is like. Yeah. What real street predators are like. It also taught me the difference between social violence and asocial violence. So social violence would be, you know, mugging in the street, fighting a pub, territorial dispute over area, blah, blah, blah. Whereas asocial violence is more, you know, sociopath, you know, yeah. you know, a serial killer, serial rapist, hopefully more in the minority than the other. But I certainly knew social violence very, very, very well. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll cut the story short. I went on 19 years old, I went to go and work on the doors. And quickly I found out this was a training laboratory. <laughs> it was like on a literally, I worked at some shit holes and you like, I'd work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then I had a, I worked on the railway on, on the rest of the week, the railroad. And that time I started strength training. So I put on some size and some strength. I wanted to be strong. But rather than take that um catalog John sort of approach, I always got into being functionally strong yeah. and powerful. So I've become an Olympic lifter on an amateur level. And I attribute Olympic lifting a lot for the reason why I can, I'm explosive, but also yeah. uh, fast twitch muscle fibers yeah, and stuff. Yeah, genetic makeup as well, but yeah. I certainly found my genetic makeup through Olympic lifting, and I applied it to martial methods. And yeah, so I was working on the doors, and I was work, training with some great people at the time. So I'd kind of gone full circle with the Eastern stuff. I trained with uh, within JKD, the concept style, style stuff, which was an accumulation, eclectic mix of the JKD that Bruce Lee left, uh, Jin Fan Kung Fu, um, some Filipino Kali, some BJJ, some shoot wrestling. It was great. I loved it. Um, yeah. so, so then I went to Thai, and then I went to original JKD, So because it's a different kind of thinking. It's always like the JKD. And then I went, I found um, combatives. But how I found it was I joined the British Combat Association. I was a friend of Jeff Thompson for quite a while because, you know, we'd be chatting. I'd gone on a few of his seminars and I liked the reality of it. And what I was realizing was that similar people that had come from similar experience come to the same conclusions. And that being that. The one that goes first with the most works out the best, usually. So it, it really didn't matter about the physical skill, the style, or anything else. Punch is a fucking punch. It doesn't matter if it comes from Wing Chun or just a, a big pikey left hand, right hand, whatever. It, it, it's about um, you know the willingness to take part in the event and the tactics of being sneaky and being first and not yeah. let catch up kind of thing. So I always knew that that, would, that that was what real violence was about. And I appreciated for the first time seeing that crossover blend between Jeff Thompson, who was a traditional karate car like I had been, uh, but I'd done it doors for years in commentary and knew the fucking difference. Yeah. And, and, the, and the tactics of defense and preemption. And I'd come to similar conclusions myself, you know, and kind of thought I was a bit like, uh, 
not ruthless, that's not the word, but unfair with the fact that, well, I've realised what works best is if I go first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it comes so comfortable with me for a while until I've got that conclusion. Because if you think about it, everything that works in the martial world comes from criminality. So what does a street mugger do? Two, two, two preferred ways that you're going to likely, the most way you're likely to get attacked in the street context of a street assault. And this information comes from one of my peers, um, South Knot, Craig Douglas in the US. And he mapped it out this way, but it's pretty much the same all over the planet. Your preferred way for a, a street criminal, so maybe he wants to rob you, beat the shit out of you for whatever reason, uh, would like to perform his act would be out of an ambush. Mm -hmm. That is the person or the victim selected has got no attention to the environment whatsoever and he's just blitzkrieged from behind and it's done. And if that person even wakes up, they will have no recollection of what happened. Yeah. That's the preferred way. So, of course, the main staple for any self-protection method must be that you your personal security allows you to have a heightened level of awareness to a point where you're most likely to spot any situation before it becomes a situation yeah so having awareness and an understanding of pre-threat cue behavior how things unfold will put you in a situation where you're likely to spot it early enough where you've got more time to respond does that make sense yeah for sure. response, of course would be to escape to get gone the self-protection of all don't fucking be there but if not it will prepare you on an emotional level as your heart rate starts to escalate, give you an opportunity to breathe, to control that to a degree and prepare yourself to engage in violence. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're logical and we're uh, um, you know, legal and ethical. Arm yourself in order preparation to deal with violence. So in which case then, if somebody sees the, the potential criminal uh, interaction begin, then the second way in which criminal will attack will be out of some kind of, after some kind of introductory dialogue. Mm -hmm. Where they come up and talk to you, we see what I call the interview. Yeah. The interview will either be deceptive, designed to take your attention, incidental, designed to take your attention, or aggressive in order to see if, whether or not you capitulate. Yeah. But the idea of it, any of those three is to dip the toe in the water to see how hot you are, how hot you are. So the predatory optic employs three things. This is the, the primary thing that a criminal will look for in a selected target, the ideal Christmas. Right? First one would be subject looks weak in some way. So that could be physically impaired, walking with a limp arm in a sling, using a stick, or emotionally okay. uh, impaired in some way. So I don't want to say the word weak or be derogatory to anybody, but... Um, if, if you were to depict somebody that was motion, emotionally lacking in confidence, hugely, yeah. then it would be immediately depicted in that outward physiology. Yeah, head looking down, shoulders yeah, hunched, so, maybe. So, and that's right. So if you think about sat tall, this is your eye line. Yeah. People that are often depressed or unhappy, and we all find it doing it yourself. Next time you're pissed off, notice how you slouch, right? But they live their life, life below eye line. Yeah. And their physiology is looking in the feet, at the feet almost and they move small and, and not, not large body movements because they don't want to be noticed. Yeah. That kind of demeanor is attractive to a criminal. Right? Second would be if they're switched off. So if they're attentive of their phone, mm -hmm. so they've got the earbuds in as well, no attention to the environment, great. Yeah. And the final thing would be, are they alone? So what, knowing this information, it, it, you can't always control whether you're alone or not course you know but of course there's safety in numbers so there's certain times when you shouldn't be alone so for example i don't know uh, back in the days of nightclubs maybe girls go to the toilet together maybe girls get in a taxi together yeah and now you're seeing you know another uh, crime wave that's been around for a while but isn't is now coming more into vogue and that is people dog napping your dog yeah yeah knife point with a threat do you know what i mean well maybe then that would be ideal as a group of dog work walkers you work together rather than go alone so there is stuff that you can do about being alone but from talking about from the perspective of when we're out and about in our daily lives good chance we're alone so there's one box ticked but you need to make sure that you're switched on alert and aware so if you're switched on alert and aware all of a sudden now you're living your life above eye line you're now head up. So think about the physiology or the body language that you would adopt if you were um, extremely excited and confident to do something. Yeah. yeah. Be very elevated. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to something you're dreading. 
Yeah. So just the action of walking with a straight spine, confident gait, look around frequently, don't be frightened to make eye contact, and smile yeah. says that you're comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. And that'll make you much less likely to be selected as a victim of assault in the first place. You understand? And of course, where possible, don't depict any type of weakness. Now, you don't have to have any kind of, you know, um, mean face, tattoos, and muscles to do that. Yeah. You know, the average pen pusher who works with a shirt and tie. Just have a confident thing about you that says grey man, not quite sure. You know what I mean? And that's going to give you a good opportunity. But I digress. The way in which a street assault is going to unfold is either out of an ambush or some kind of interview, introductory dialogue. And there it's going to be pretty close range, right? So that takes away a lot of the understanding of the martial arts. And most martial arts is three ranges. There's kicking range, there's punching range, and there's grappling range. And that is apt for combat sport. But in the street, there's two ranges. There's conversation range, less than two feet, so where we would meet and greet and shake hands that distance. Most human interaction will take place from here, including violence. And if it's not here, it's in your fucking face. And that's dictated by the environment, either a busy, crowded nightclub, really noisy, can't hear you, uh, you know, crowded environment, confined space, or ego. Do you know what I mean? So you, the, 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 you, whatever you learn in a physical sense needs to be able to work at that range. So I say, you know, learn to become adapt with all your physical tools left and right and be able to work within the realms of a phone box. Yeah. Because that's where close quarter combat takes place, right? So it's going to be close range. In order for most people to get the highest probability of success, particularly if it's not a spontaneous thing, but a planned thing done with regularity. So let's look at street robbery. Let's look at kids that do street robbery for a living. That's how they earn their money. They do it a lot and they're good at it. They've worked out how best to do it, right? Yeah. In which case, they're most likely to um, stack the odds in their favor. So they'll probably have a weapon. Yeah. They will indeed have a weapon. And also there's more likely to be more than one of them. So the two expectations you need to have in any confrontational situation that you find yourself in, expect he's got a weapon and he's got a mate. Yeah. And what you're seeing now is an involvement, an involvement in the modern threat, you know, since the fucking gates have been dropped and everyone from fucking anywhere has been allowed to swarm into fucking Europe to the point where they've devoured it. You need to understand there's consequences to that. Because any group of people that you send from a war-torn country that have had to fight and fucking use violence and experience violence just to live and get through the day, they are potentially fucking problematic when they meet a society that is more concerned about their fucking man bun and their soy latte. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm true. saying? It's going to be conflict and a problem. So around about that time when you know all of these individuals were, were allowed to, to come in here which is all part of a bigger plan i'm sure that um you started to see threat evolve and now what the threat that evolves is the worst possible case scenario so throughout all of my career right in, unless you count football violence Football violence will be organized bunch of people who haven't know how many you got you know how many we've got and we're all fucking tooled up right it, uh, in terms of tooled up, it's, it was bats and bricks in them days, right? But on the whole, generally, if you had a fight with a guy in a pub, he'll probably pick up a glass, use a bottle. Yeah. You could be dealing with somebody that's got a knife quite frequently or a weapon of some kind. But most of the time, it was like two or three lads against one lad. And it was you know, fight, punch, fight. You know, the disparity was numbers in their favour. Sure. And that was bad enough. And that's what most of us, you know, that's what we'd all train for. But now you're looking at worst possible case scenario. You're looking at multiple armed assailants. You know, they don't put in the media the, the frequency of, of the kind of situations that were unfolding as a result of that. So, as an example, two Somalian gangs fighting in Coventry outside of fucking Primar on a Saturday where everyone's out with their kids and they're fighting with machetes. Yeah. So... <laughs> There's an involvement in the threat. So I recognized this quite early on and I started to shift my uh, urban combative teaching from basic self-protection for you know, the average Joe, which it still stands, to more of a tier one civilian 
yeah. type of idea where, you know, the uh, so tier one analogy would be the best of the best. And it usually is used in a military sense, um, but you could use it in any context. So use it in the context of a civilian who practices self-protection for the purpose of protecting himself and his family. Yeah. Noble thing. Um, how, what skills and kind of mentality mindset shift would that self-protection student need to have in order to become the best he could fucking possibly be? Yeah. So if you look at, it, well, first of all, we, before you look at any solution, you need to look at the problem. So as the modern threat was starting to change, beginning with that, you started to see more uh, events of active threat. So in, in, in the US, you would call it, or internationally, you would call it in, uh, um, active shooter. Yes. Yeah. And that would be primarily because of the access to firearms. Whereas in the UK for, you know, going back two, two three years ago now, the, the, the access for these people to get to firearms seemed somewhat limited because their MO was to get in a vehicle of heavy impact, smash into people, jump out with two bladed weapons yeah. taped to their hands because they've researched and they understand that the effects of adrenaline on the body will make their hands cumbersome and they'll drop the weapon. So they strapped it to their arms, one in each hand, and literally hack into pieces as many infidels as they can find. Right? And with the objective being to decapitate, yeah. we were seeing elements of this. Now, if you fast forward into um, you know current situation, then you know I'll say as I see it, many of those incidents are fucking false flags. Mm. And by false flags, I don't mean that was an event that happened on the back of those people or that uh, fanatical group or whatever else. I believe that that was fucking absolutely sanctioned by our own. Right. But nonetheless, false flag, real thing, not real thing, conspiracy, not conspiracy. The event itself was happening. Yeah. You were getting multiple armed assailants attacking people all over Europe. Yeah. You know, one of the first ones I read about was um, you know, a guy going into all these in Germany and beheading a woman before he attacked everyone else. Well, if you suddenly face with that kind of level of violence around you, the majority of society, or near enough all of them, unless they've been in some kind of military conflict before, whether we're familiar with that degree of violence or beyond it, are going to absolutely freeze, capitulate, scream, panic, and run in all directions. You know, there's just nobody going to be equipped to deal with that. And I looked at the current self-protection things that were being taught, and I'm thinking, fuck, we need to evolve. So, you know, here's the example of uh, the, the attacks on women in Europe, mm -hmm. sexual assaults on women in Europe, had increased by 75%. The MO that you were seeing was two or three men of um, whatever origin were taking one or two women and gang raping them at knife point. Now, I don't know of any unarmed skill set that I could teach a woman that would allow her to effectively deal with that in a physical sense if she had the psychological capability to access what she needed emotionally. Yeah. And that's yeah. a big if. And I honestly, there is no way that, that you're going to equal that disparity. So the simplest thing that will equal that disparity is a bladed weapon, without a doubt. So the very first thing I teach any woman how to do is stick something sharp into the eye of whoever's in front of her. Yeah. Do it as sneakily and as fast as possible, just about half an inch of something sharp. It could be a pen, it could be a pencil, it could be a small fixed blade by design where legality allows. In Germany, you can carry a small fixed blade. Germany, most yeah. of these attacks are happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Somebody broke in your house and you picked up a tool, something sharp. How do you put something sharp in somebody's fucking eyeball? In the most gross white way, simple. In order to create that stun and run like fuck mm -hmm. tactic. Now she's got a shot. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. EMO, three guys follow a woman to an underground car park, which is lit when she left for work. It's now darkened and secluded. She's switched on to them behind her. She's put her keys in her hand. Let's say she's put her key in her hand in a way in which you can stick it in your fucking eyeball. And as soon as these three approach and she recognizes she's about to be triangulated, she fucking stabs one right through the eye. Yeah. And it just goes from really passive to a fucking handicap mental. Just takes his face like a buzzsaw. Well, I put it to you, these two friends are fucking pause. And that will give you an opportunity to either get in that car lock the door and drive off or run like fuck. 
Yeah. 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 I think that prob- that kind of level of probability and understanding was necessary. So I've taught that all over Europe. Yeah. Now I started to implement other skills. So as a tier one civilian, understand that that would be a citizen that trains in this stuff like we all do, but had enough of a skill set and a mentality or a mindset that if they found themselves in a critical incident, so shop and all of a sudden two active threats run in and start fucking cutting people to pieces. One example. Yeah. Uh, mass hysteria, cry, crowd riot, everybody's attacking everybody. Or uh, civil unrest where, you know, the uh, vaxxers are going against the anti-vaxxers and you're targeted because you're not wearing a mask and all of a sudden just oh, mass fucking chaos. Can you imagine that? Yeah. <laughs> Multiple armed assailants attacking people in the street. Armed home invasion, which happened during the first lockdown and is happening now. Uh, imagine that we became, because it's not un, you know, unlikely to, to at least plausibly think, for a period of time, short period of time, we become lawless. Societal breakdown, boom, all bets are off. Yeah. There is no legal system intact to, to deal with anyone. And everyone, like purge. You hear the purge uh, sirens going on. Yeah, the multiple <laughs> armed assailants coming through your door to take what you've got, particularly if there's a food shortage, is a huge possibility. And if you are going to go out in transport to try and get supplies, there's a huge possibility you get run off the road and whatever. So I can foresaw all this, and I'm thinking, well, what skills would you need if you had any chance of fucking dealing with any of that? Well, first of all, you need exceptional unarmed skills. Yeah. And I mean military grade. Beyond, so yeah. Special forces units all over the world. I've taught everyone. I don't teach them something different. You know, the physical tools are the physical tools. The primary thing that changes is targeting. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a big difference between me slapping you concussively in the face or a shaky brain in your unconscious and you wake up with a red mark and me pulverizing your brainstem. Do you know what I mean? There's a big difference. So obviously content of material practice is dictated by the context of the fucking situation, right? So I say to people, in a tier one type seminar, I'll say, Right, you're going to learn things here. You're going to learn high-level grade unarmed skills. You're also going to learn how to use a point and an edge tool. Mm-hmm. So by design, such as a small fixed blade, because that's what I prefer. I'm a fan of big, nice, small fixed blade. Or a spike, like an ice pick type of uh, uh, weapon attribute. Or anything that had an edge and a point or a point that you could do tissue damage with quickly. Yeah. You should be good with that. You should know how to use it. You should also know how to use any blunt force impact weapon for blunt force trauma. And understand the difference. Understand that a blade or a spike doesn't really have any ballistic value. So I want to use it to uh, a fast bleed out target or an instantaneous switch target so I get an instantaneous effect. Whereas uh, an impact weapon is going to create compound depression, fracture, swelling of the brain, coma and death. In the worst case scenario, so you need to know what the capability of the tool is. That immediately puts you in context with where it belongs. We go, well, why would I learn how to do that? Well, in any one of those situations, imagine three fuckers coming through your house, they've all got machetes. They're going to rape and kill your kids and then kill you. And then they're going to take everything you've got and try to burn your house down. I mean, that kind of threat. We all fucking bets are off now, don't you? For sure. You know what I'm saying? So, in the context of that, so I say to them, Magic, the first thing I would teach you with a, a blade is it's potentially use it less than lethally. But if after one motion with that blade where I've stabbed you in the eye, there's a high probability it's done now. But if not, then anything that escalates above this is going to be potentially lethal force. Yeah. Uh, where does that belong? So I'll give him a scenario. So, so imagine you're in a restaurant and you're eating a nice meal, meal and you might maybe you're eating a steak meal, so you've got a steak knife. So I'll give context and reason. There's people all around, it's a family diner, people having a great time, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, this guy walks in and everybody's switched off because they're fucking sheep. But because you're a tier one civilian, you're fucking switched on and you spot anomalies quick. So you see this guy coming in through on a summer's day with a coat that's too fucking heavy, sweating profusely and looking nervous. And then he happens to just sit down next to you and he's got a bag with him. And he sat down between him next to you. Then I cut the bit out for, for the reason. And I say, in what world, on what planet? Would it be justifiably correct and the only thing I could do for me to suddenly leave where I am with my family eating my meal, leap across this guy's table, 
and stab him repeatedly in the heart, lungs, and throat until he's dead. Mm -hmm. And then people go, oh, well, no context at all. And then I give them context. I say, well, imagine a situation. I've noticed him, he's sweating profusely, he's got a bag, he's sat down next to me, he's put the bag between his legs. I managed to glance to get a clear view, and I can see clearly he's putting a magazine in a semi-automatic weapon that he's about to pull out and kill every motherfucker in the room with, including me and my family. Is it justifiable now that I stop him? For sure. It is. Right, so that's the context of where plausibly a level 10 use of violence with a weapon yeah. would belong. And it only belongs in such a place out of lack of sheer desperation. Yeah. You know, me or you, I'm going home, not you. <laughs> and if I'm not, you're coming. You yeah, know, last I'm, resort. Do everything I can to prevail life, my own and others, or I'm going to die doing it. So in which case then I want those skills. So you notice it was unarmed skills. How do you use a point and impact weapon? Yeah. At point and edge weapon, how do you use an impact weapon? Primarily from a UK perspective, that's where it ends for us. Outside of that, any improvised weapon of opportunity. But we don't have firearms. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying I'm giving it tier one civilian from a law abiding or good citizen at least point of view. So, but it does incorporate shooting because any um, tier one civilian, anyone that travels to abroad, let alone teaches in third world countries yeah. or has dealings elsewhere or in the US or wherever else, will have the opportunity to shoot, in which case learn how to shoot. Yep. So good unarmed skills, you can use a blade, you can use an impact tool, you can shoot fucking well. Yep. That combatively is, is already put you at a much higher scale. Yeah? Sure. What you would add to that would be some kind of um, tactical uh, combat casualty care. Yeah. So like heavy bleeding and things like that. Deal with this massive blood trauma, because that's yeah. what's most likely. So a tier one civilian event could be a, a pile up crash on the motorway. And you know, people are hurt. Well, have you got kit? Do you know how to apply a tourniquet? Do you know how to wound pack? Do you know how to deal with a deflated lung, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So these skills certainly belong. Yeah. From there, maybe some bushcraft skills in case you have to bug out. Maybe some urban skills where if the grid went down, would you know how to find water, etc. Da, da, da. Maybe some unlawful counter custody skills. So, for example, if you travel to a third world country, whereas a, a just a Western male or, or female, you're a target. And you could be taken for the purpose of blackmail, ransom, whatever else. But if you were immediately taken and bundled into a man, there's a good chance you'd be duct taped or zinc. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have any understanding of how to break free from that? Because once they get you to a more secure location, you're going to be severely bound. So you might have an opportunity to, to escape now if you can break zip ties destructively or non destructively. Uh, get uh, duct tape off your wrists, etc. That kind of stuff. So, in a myriad of skills. And then you start to bring in like EDC. So EDC is everyday carry. And I'm not talking geek squad. I'm talking the bare minimum. What have you got on you that you could improvise as a weapon? Have you got comms, communications? You can get the fuck out of Dodge. Have you got means? Have you got money and a credit card? You know, have you got uh, at least a tourniquet and a, 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 a pressure bandage if there was an incident? Now, what have you got on your wrist? So on my wrist, I wear a, a band, which gives me weapon retention so that I won't yeah. drop the weapon when adrenaline hits my body. I also usually wear a small thing around here, which is capability to break a window. And I wear a, um, a hand cock, which is just like a, um, a bracelet, which gives me the ability to bind if somebody was to become hostile on a plane or some shit like that. So the tier one civilian is more of a lifestyle. Yeah. And what we'd accompany that would be a shift in mindset. First of all, the shift in mentality would be, um, uh, I know the level of violence has changed. My head's not buried in the sand and I know it can happen to anyone at any time for any fucking reason or anything. Yeah. And I also have an understanding from a self-awareness point of view of my willingness to take part in that. Mm. So if somebody's going to offer you a, a significant amount of violence and the only way to deal with them would be to access... Uh, a level of aggression and violence that totally eclipsed theirs yeah. before they did it. Well, that's a certain kind of mental conditioning would be required for that. Chances are, if you know, you, you, you never had so much as a fucking row with your girlfriend, that you, you, you're not going to be able to get your head around that ever. Yeah. 
period, right? So it's, it's not tier one civilian is not for everyone, but it's for those people that are serious enough to recognize world's fucking changed, life's cheap now, violence is totally desensitized, all part of the plan. I mean, if you watch TV 15 years ago, yeah, you, you wouldn't see the level of violence, sex that you see now. Yeah. If you look at what's available on the internet, I mean, it, it, there was there was never any CCTV footage shown on the news of a moment somebody was actually shot or stabbed. It was always blackout. Viewers might find it disturbing. Now people are sharing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, brutal fucking. You know what I mean? It's become massively desensitized, which again is all part of the agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they want they want us to feel life's cheap. And then, you know, let savages in through the gate and ask yourself what's going to happen. Is there going to be an escalation in the modern day threat? Fuck yes, there is. Yeah. And in which case, my UC, um, that I still teach, you know, basic self protection game plan, aware preemption, continuous attack escape, how to do a common unarmed assault, etc., from an unarmed perspective. I still teach that. But really, I advise everybody, you know, you, you want to stand a chance against that, you need to know that. Yeah, because the bottom line is, you know, bad people hurt bad people and bad people hurt good people. You want to deal with bad people, you've got to learn some bad. Yeah. Simple as that. For sure. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's where um, my training has evolved kind of now. Well, this the last couple of years. So probably the last five years it took the turn this way. And, of course, many of those things are still prominent, you know, but now, it, now a lot of people have this expectation of what they call shit hit the fan type scenario. Mm -hmm. And the main thing you got to think about is if that kind of scenario happened, if there was an uprising with become lawless, societal breakdown for however significant a period of time, long or short, what would happen? Well, you know, obviously resources, food, medicine, supplies, fuel, everything it would be in fact, would it be there? In which case, if anyone has had the opportunity to you know, create some preparation, I mean, I mean, that's what this prepping thing is all about. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even to a fair degree, and somebody knows or thinks or assumes that you've got something they ain't got, guess where they're going? And you're talking multiple armed threats. I mean, like, I live in a new forest, and it's great. And my surrounding area, you know, normal, nice people. But if I looked at where I live right now from a predatory perspective, I'd be a, a fox in a chicken coop. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And surrounding areas of uh, the new forest, you know, there, there's people who are much more predatory-like and it's street light and hard upbringing. And, you know, they would exploit the likes of yeah. such neighbours who have fucking zero preparation for anything. I mean, they're lining up for the vaccination. What does that tell you? <laughs> so, I mean, but... There has been a massive shift and in terms of modern day threat and where it could go. Now, I'm an optimist, so I'm optimistic about this whole situation. I believe this tyranny will fucking fall yep. at some point. I, you know, I, can, I can see that happening in my lifetime. And um, I believe things will be better for the future. I really, I really do. I, I really do believe that because after the tier one civilian stuff and the preparations that I made for that, you know, and then this, all of a sudden, this scandemic, I went down a rabbit hole. I'd done all my research and I looked, I sorted the wheat from the chaff and I've looked at lots of things. Anyway, where it took me was a dark place. Mm -hmm. Because it took me to a dark place, it, you know, to the point where, fuck me, human nature will never fail to astound me to the levels of deprivation that it could drop to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it made me ashamed to be human almost. Yeah. And anyway, with that, I started to look, well, you know, if there's that much dark, there's gotta be some light somewhere. And I started to try and tune in a bit more to myself. I started meditating for, you know, just to get past the anatomical mind, just to get some de-stress, decompression time, if you like. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I just felt this difference in me. I, my intuition kicked in. I found myself more intuitive. Colours around me looked slightly different. And what I recognised is that people that were around me, I didn't fit with them anymore. You know, I talk about this situation. And, of course, it takes balls to stand up and say that you're awake. Yeah. 
because you know particularly someone who's in a limelight you know what i mean you know what I mean? but yeah. m- more more so from your own personal perspective because like i've got family that don't talk to me now because they're willfully ignorant they know something's going on but if they live in their little bubble they'll be all right well, it's, it's nothing to do with us well what do you mean fucking becoming a tyrannical left fucking communist government where we are more slaves than we've ever been is not your business. Whose fucking business is it? And if you know something's going on, but you don't want to know, you're willfully ignorant. I personally, you've got no excuse for that. Yeah. You're either awake or you're a fucking sheep, right? But don't be awake, but you don't want to be awake and you go back to sleep. That's inexcusable. You know, so obviously it's created lots of rifts and it ruffles feathers. Of course it does. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? People think, oh, he's lost his, he's off his head. He's, you know what I mean? And they think, especially when I start talking about how I become more spiritual yeah. mm-hmm. and how I realized, you know, the awakening to me is not just waking up to when I'm being fed a, a load of bollocks. The waking up is to waking up to what you actually are and what you're capable of. You know, that's a bit fucking with the food chain, fucking with the water supply, the fluoride, calcifies the pineal gland, all sorts of things have been done to keep us dumbed down in a spiritual intuitive sense. And then of course the great awakening happens when well, regardless of what you think about that, do your research. But when there was this planetary alignment and that week and a rebirth of the sun, et cetera, et cetera, the ascension of the planet went from a three dimension to a higher dimension, higher density. Everybody lives in this 3D world, and I summarize it now, now I'm awake as, imagine a bucket in front of you, and you put your head in the bucket, and somebody puts a towel over your head, so all you see is what's inside the bucket. And then you throw little things inside the bucket, like what's happening in Big Brother, and what's going on in the political scene in America, and this and that, and this fear-mongering, and that fear-mongering, and that, all those little pieces in this bucket is your life. That's your, that's your dimension. That's your state of being. And it's three-dimensional. And I feel like I've just took my head out of the bucket and done a 360 and realized, fuck me, there's more to this than that. And before actually I got to that point, I kind of felt no man's land. So I was in limbo. I felt like, oh, I don't belong here. Mm. I'm not getting around people anymore. I'm feeling different about everything. But I hadn't awakened. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah, like, yeah, yeah. To any point where I was like new. And then, so in, in a bit of a layman's land, and then the 21st of December, we went to um, Glastonbury to this to the Tour Monument. And they'd fucked with the, the, the weather so that you couldn't see what was actually going on, but it was actually the alignment of Jupiter with Saturn. And uh, um, yeah, a winter solstice event that had taken so many hundreds of years to come around and happen. And I, I felt it. And with the place I was in at the time and the people around, I believe we all felt there was something. But what it wasn't did you feel? It wasn't until a couple of days later that I was driving and I live in a forest and I was going to the gym and I took the wrong turn in. So I had to take another road and the road that took put me on road with the sun because, you know, the sun kind of devitalized and then is reborn somehow, re-energized. Yeah. That's what the winter solstice thing was about. Which there was a new sun and it was beaming and it was beaming right on my head. And I'm driving and I just felt this almost like this because I'd researched all this and everything else and realized that your pineal gland, so called third eye, which is your intuitive window, if you like, sixth sense, there's nothing freaky or supernatural about it. It's not an eye that you can see, you can see it in your head. It's like a portal and it's like, a, it just gives you, a, makes you more in tune, more intuitive. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That makes sense is difficult to explain. But if yeah, anyone yeah. has received the same phenomena, and there's millions of people, will say the same thing. I just felt like in that moment, I elevated to a high level of consciousness, if you like, whether that's fourth dimension, fifth dimension, whatever the fuck it is. Now, I've pursued it relentlessly as a lifestyle, and I've come to, to recognize come to find some fantastic people during these periods of lockdown you know because it, it depends how you look at it and the perspective of things but during the first lockdown i learned loads of new skills i learned how to flint nap i learned how to make weapons and tools and training tools and did loads of shit and in this one i did research and my research also took me on to esoteric type of research and i found some brilliant people like 
uh, Hart Tolley, who wrote yeah. the book The Power of Power Now. Now. Yeah. yeah, and and quite other people like uh, you know Wim Hof with the, the um, holotropic breathing, and others for meditation, and others for this, but more of an esoteric spiritual type of path. And I've come to the understanding that we are indeed a part of everything that is, ever has been, and ever will be. We are so much more than this vehicle. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And everybody is the same. If you drop the skin suit, there'd be a little flicker like a candle of essence. And that doesn't matter if your skin suit was black, yellow, brown, pink, or pol- yeah. periwinkle, fucking blue. If you drop the suit, we're all the same. And if it all come together, you wouldn't be able to differentiate that energy. And But that's why we all have this auric field. So whether if you're in tune with yourself, so understand that you're, I've learned now that your 3D body, your physical body, is what you your perception of you is. But you have, in fact, a number of bodies. You have an emotional body. You have a spiritual body. You have auras of dimension. And there's means in which using certain frequency uh, photo imaging that they can actually show you these thermal auras Right. That you have, and each of us has it, and it's particularly those tuned into it. So rather than think anatically with your mind, as the shamans say, feel with your heart mm-hmm. and know with your guts. Because there's three brains: head, heart, guts. Yeah. You don't use this. You should use this. Trust me. All right. But when you intuitively just have that knowing that something is so, then it's inarguable. So many people get a spiritual awakening in different ways. So they have meditation and they see visions or things come to them. I don't get any of that. I don't get nothing visual. So much so that I'll question myself, oh, why don't I? But I get a sense of knowing. And when I know, I fucking know. And I just got this intuitive shift (laughs) that week of the the, the great awakening that's been written about forever. Yeah. Whether it's in now, I don't believe in man-made religion at all. It was hijacked a very long time ago so for the corruption of man. But if you look in um, uh, Christianity, if you look in the Old Testament, if you look in Native American Indians, if you look in the Jewish um, Bible equivalent, if you look in the um, Quran, all of the similarities and commonality of this awakening period are talked about. So there, there's definitely something to it. And I believe that, well, without going into it, this whole thing of divide and conquer, separate, two meter distance, don't look at each other, no mask, is designed to separate humanity. Mm. So it's just, it's just that, that aura that I was talking about, this was my point. You radiate for six and a half feet in every direction. You notice how we've got to stay six and a half feet apart? Yeah. The whole time, the social separation, all of this, it's all, des- it's all designed so that we don't get together, congregate, feel that energy, because we're in a fucking spiritual war now. Mm-hmm. We're in a war between bad and good, I'm telling you. It's not a flesh and blood fight that you can fight, although there will be pockets and elements of that. This really is about vibration, you know? And if everybody got together, the, 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 the simplest way to destroy... Um, evil would be through love and, and gratitude. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So what, what's, what's the constant emotional thing that's going on all the time? Fear mongering. Yeah. Another strain yeah. from here. Oh, this is happening. Oh, we can't do this. We can't do that. Yeah. And look how absurd that they're pushing forward certain things now that make you, will make your ancestors spit in their grave. I mean, like all the letters that they're putting now after genders, they now want to add a P for paedophilia, saying that paedophilia is a sexuality. It's not a crime. I mean, ridiculous shit. Mm. You know, stuff that they're selling on big corporate companies like Amazon are selling uh, derogatory uh, paedophilia stuff. Like, I don't even want to say it, but there was a a, a sequin dress for a four-year-old girl. And it said on it, Grandpa's little such and such slut. I mean, how is that okay? Right. Do you know what I mean? All of these things that are being shown, 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 and nobody's going, whoa, what's going on? Wait a minute, the world's gone mad. Everything's been inverted. So if you look at, like, just the other day, I saw, like, a catwalk with five male models walking down, sporting a pregnant woman's stomach. What the yeah, fuck? Yeah, I saw that, yeah. It's inverted. Mm. If you look at where that comes from, it's all satanic, mm. all of it. 
Do you know what I'm saying? And if you want to destroy a, a low vibration of fear, what's what's the opposite to fear? Love. Yeah. So people say, if I said to you, what's the opposite of love? You say, hey, no, fear. Yeah. Fear creates the lowest vibration ever, which destroys you. It's a fact. There's only a single human, a uh, single um, organic organism on the planet that can sustain a significant period of time in the fight or flight response. Yeah in sympathetic nervous system. They cannot remain in it. Everybody's been in it for nearly a year now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. You notice what they don't talk about? They don't talk about your immune system. No. Apparently, the immune system given to us by our creator. That's why, like, when you do your own research and it takes you to people like Wim Hof, who's doing cold therapy, which produces masses of white blood cells, which boost your immune system no end. The fact that we need fresh air, sunlight, human contact and smiles, this is all necessary to our DNA to thrive. I mean, none of that's being mentioned. And the, the fact for me now is that they've just, all critical thinking is gone. Yeah. And in and, and all self-respect is gone. Yeah. It's because yeah. people are scared and the propaganda. Thumb right up your ass because it'll halt the strain of COVID that's coming next. How many would do it? There would be a number. Yeah. You know, and I think that's just uh, you know a shame. Lost, lost. Definitely. But yeah, the point was some of us have woke up. Some of us might just be woke up to the bullshit. Some people might not even be waking up to the bullshit, but on a spiritual level, have ascended. And I believe more and more will, and the, the, the tipping point will eventually be met. And we'll see some difference in this. Is that so, what you see then in the near future? That's that's I, I, I honestly believe that heaven or hell is manifested inside of you. Mm. You know, you just get back to that Urquhart Tolly. I mean, you think about this. All we really have is moments and now. That's all we got. Yeah. So we got this interview, however long left, right? We've got the moments of now, now, what comes after now and now. It's all present moment. It's just a series of present moments. Before you know it, be tomorrow, this will be a memory. And it's gone. We think about it, but it's gone. So all you've got is moments of now. So what this propaganda does, it freezes people in the past or the future. So they're wasting the now, thinking about what they did wrong and what's happening before. Yeah. Or they're wasting now, worrying about what's going to happen next, but they can't do nothing about it anyway. So they're wasting life. They're wasting the now, worrying about the past or the future that they can't control is gone. And that's creating this negative cycle of thoughts. Well, your thoughts affect your feelings. Yeah. And how you feel is your state of being. So in every waking moment, because all you've got is moments of now, you can choose how you spend them. Right? Because with all the carnage going on, chances are right now, at this moment, you're not in any immediate danger at all, are you? No, of course you're not. Probably in a nice, well-lit room that's moderately warm. Yeah. I'm surrounded by you know, my beautiful wife, got my lovely dog. I'm living in the forest, I'm just about to have something nice to eat. You know, so today I was out in the forest. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to go out into my gym and I'm going to start training in the morning and I'll take my cold shower, blah, blah, blah. It's all good. Chances are right now, you, there ain't nothing going to hurt you. Yeah. So why waste right now worrying about something that is from past or present that's going to put you in that fight or flight state? Why don't you appreciate the moment of now, being that that's all you've got, a series of moments of now, and make it the best moment of now that you, you could ever could. You know, every, every footstep I take, I want to be the, the, the best footstep I take, you know? I mean, getting out in nature, so I go out in nature, I'm very fortunate that I live this, you know, out here, but I'm at the beach or the forest every day, and I'll take my shoes off and I'll just ground my feet to the earth and I'll just walk for, you know, miles yeah. and it, take in the elements and be in the moment now. And I might meditate in there, or I might just, whatever, play with my dog, but I'm enjoying life and while i'm doing that i ain't thinking about none of this shit <laughs> so that's what i mean you manifest your own heaven or hell because it's all controlled by your thoughts you know if you choose to be thrown into turn the fucking telly off <laughs> mainstream media and stop reading the papers stop listening to that shit because that's putting you in that sympathetic nervous system all the time yeah. 
fight or flight state. You want to be parasympathetic nervous system, natural homeostasis, feed and breed state. That's where you want to be, where everything around you is cool. That's where they don't want us. That's where your immune system is strong. So you get out fresh air, sunshine, exercise, human contact, smiles. But when they're creating a narrative that is more depressing than the potential consequences of the so-called virus, anyway, I'd rather say, mate, I'll take your fucking chances. Take chances, yeah. I live my life. So what you've got to answer yourself is, well, particularly the older folk who I do feel sorry for, you know, that worry that they might catch you or someone's going to give them it, someone they know is going to die. Well, how long do you think you got left? I'm not being funny. How long have any of us got left? I'm 50, nearly 53 now. Let's face it, we all shuffle off this mortal coil, and I believe we go onward. But we all shuffle off this mortal coil. We know that. So rather than worrying about when you're going to die, why don't you worry about how you want to live? When you're going to live, yeah. How you got? How you're going to live with what you got left? Yeah. You know. Imagine rewinding three months, Sam and I, and as somebody that's been tuned in to the media, panic-stricken about it, worried, fight or flight state all the time. Is, is suddenly you know dead and before they die you could rewind the last three months and say well look if you could just thought this you would have had a better time so if, you know, your thoughts control your feelings and your feelings are your state of being are your life so how do you do that you say well meditation is the key meditation is the key so this i'll, I'll sharp about this now but i'll leave you with this meditation is is many forms of it but what you want to do is persevere Get the right coaching. There's plenty of good tutorials. Learn how to do it. All you're striving to do is take yourself from where you are right now in terms of brainwaves. So in brainwaves now, we're in beta brainwaves. And we're in low to medium state of beta brainwaves because we're having a chill conversation. Yeah. But any, at any point, there could be high wave beta brainwaves where you're manic and agitated and ooh, angst. Well, you want to get out of beta brainwaves into what you call alpha brainwaves. So alpha brainwaves would be that mm, you just relax and don't have to think about anything. Yeah. And that would go into theta brainwaves, which where you, you could fall asleep. Yeah. You can achieve that emotional state by resting, getting comfortably, getting a nice place and just focusing on box breathing. So focus on four seconds, breathing in, holding for four seconds, breathing out for four seconds, etc. Repeat. And don't consciously, cognitively think about anything. If thoughts come, just let them go like clouds mm. passing. And where you'll get as you focus on your breathing, you'll go from beta brainwave to alpha brainwave, which is where now your anatomical mind is idle. You're in the moment, the elusive moment, right? Mm. And you can do a little experiment yourself for the next 10 seconds. I'm going to focus just on the now, no other thoughts. And if you get 10 seconds, you push it to 20 seconds and three. I can get to about two or three minutes without a single thought entering my head. And if it does come back and that it's got a thought comes, I just let it go and then I just recenter myself. And I meditate every morning for about 30 minutes. Don't even need to do it that long, right? But what that allows me to do is quieten my mind and almost be in that still place. So the only way I can describe it is imagine taking a big breath in and dumping in the deep end of the swimming pool. And you go right down and there's that moment of complete stillness before you start to rise up. Never felt anything so calm like that in my life. That's the, the emotional state that you can get into when you get that in that's called moment of now, yeah. being in now. And you can practice it by like just sitting in a tranquil place and going, right, what is everything I can see? And then identify everything that you can hear and identify everything you can feel. And you'll get to the point where you can hear your heartbeat and you feel like you're almost like melted into the structure that you sat on. You know, and you don't need nothing pharmaceutical to get you there. Yeah, yeah, or anyway, yeah. back in, mate, it's just like, that, and that, that is within us all to get control of your thoughts. Well, if you control your thoughts, if you become a master of your thoughts, you'll control your emotional state and your fucking destiny. So, you know, you, what you'll notice then when you do meditate is that you'll notice that subconscious brain, which is, so you've got conscious brain, cognitive, subconscious and unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. With subconscious and unconscious brain equate to 95% of your brain capacity, which is totally untapped. We only use 5% frontal neocortex, cognitive conscious brain. 
And the reason for that is, is because we've been fucking pacified and tamed down with fluoride and shit in the water and shit in the air and shit in the food for a reason. They don't want us to tap into that. But when you quieten that, you recognize that your subconscious brain fires all sorts of random thoughts at you. And a lot of them are fucking negative. You might think, why am I thinking that? I don't want to do that. But it's just a random thought. So the path of least resistance is no constructive path. So you let the, I imagine that as a, a ship and a ship wheel, you know, those wooden wheels, and it should be going clockwise. If it's going clockwise, you're, you're in correct homeostasis all the time. You're, in a, you're, you're assertive, you're constructive to your evolution. And if the subconscious brain is left to its own devices, that takes effort, so it won't do anything. You put its hands off the steering wheel, and before you know it, you're steering left. And when you're steering left, now you're just thinking all sorts of toxic, random, broken biscuit shit. None of which, when your internal dialogue passes through you on a subconscious level, stimulates a feeling of well-being. It instead stimulates a feeling of agitation, yeah. dread, anger, you know, frustration. You never woke up in the morning and feel shitty. And you think, why am I feeling shitty? That's your subconscious brain giving you a thought pattern that you're cognitively unaware of that makes you feel a certain way. And you keep doing it as a habit. So it's a habit, it's a cycle that you've got to break. You only ever break it if you realize you're doing it. Yeah. You meditate and get to that nanatical mind. You recognize these thoughts coming in. And it's right here you can make significant change in your life because now you just fucking refire and wire. You just reprogram. You focus on something that you do more constructively want to think about. Because your subconscious brain will always do what's best for you if it has the choice. If you're given it no choice and you don't program thoughts constructively, too many people think about what they don't want to happen yeah. rather than think about what they want. And this idea of manifesting your own reality is real, I'm telling you. There's something in it. Research it, son, seriously. Because part of my awakening has made me find it. So my path now as a teacher has shifted again. I'm about to launch in the next month a sister channel to the UC channel okay. called Path to the Peaceful Warrior. And what it will have is it will have non... So the, the UC is, is where everything is. The Urban Combatives YouTube channel is predominantly dealing with violence and the psychology relating to dealing with violence. And I'm talking level 10 threat. So I understand Combatives is at the extreme end of the self-protection scale because it deals with up to and including deadly force threat, right? That channel has that. But a sister channel, which would be part of the Peaceful Warrior, is all about non-physical self-protection. And by non-physical self-protection, that will include, of course, soft skills, enhancing awareness, recognizing pre-threat behavior patterns, learning to control the emotional response of adrenaline, all non-physical. But it will include things that protect you on a much greater scale. So cross-training for strength and conditioning, so that I've got some physical functional body armor to apply to my physical skill set. And it will be, uh, you know, like stuff like mace belt, kettlebell, sandbag work, calisthenics, implemented tasks specifically to how you fight. Yeah. So again, a non-physical topic. And then it will go to um, dietary, nutrition, supplementation, because supplementation, particularly for your immune system. So there will be a clip on there as an example, how to boost your immune system. And understanding your, your, um, your, how to keep your nervous system in check. So if you boost in your immune system, that's a form of self-protection, isn't it? Yeah. It's non-physical oh, yeah, yeah. self-protection. So how do you enhance your, your, your immune system, particularly in current times? So it might talk about a whole section on cold water therapy, ice baths, might look at the holotropic breathing. Right? Then there might be a section on spiritual and more getting in connection with the universe. So getting out in nature forest bathing how do you meditate how do you visualize etc 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 so it will all be geared towards the things that i would say are the opposite of the coin yeah because there's no front without a back yeah and it's bizarre to me because like before all of this happened i five years ago i started a working title of path to the peaceful warrior 
and I even had it like tattooed on my body, you know, this terminology. And I didn't think of it in any way as, you know, a spiritual peaceful warrior. I just thought about it as balance. The yin yang. You know, the yin and yang, yeah. The front without, no front without back. Yes, I'm capable. I'm capable of a, a level of violence instantaneously that will fucking astound you. Man. That will astound you. But I'm equally capable of empathy, caring, love, kindness. Ask anyone that knows me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I have an empathy for like the elderly, for children, for animals, for women. You know, I, I know that I am a grey magician because i've spent my entire life studying dark arts the martial methods are dark regardless of particularly the way i train it i train it for the reality of dealing with violence yeah so i really jordan peterson's a great guy to look at he said about um uh three types of dangerous man so he said you've got the nefarious man the nefarious criminal who of course is dangerous and uses it as his skill set then you got don't like the terminology american and corny but you've got the hero okay and the hero is the one that will stand up for what's good and right and then you've got the weak man so three types of dangerous man nefarious hero weak man the weak man is usually the politician and the politician will say something along the lines of no good man should ever be capable of violence. And you must be a socially accepted, hence the pacified beta male that you see now. Alpha males still exist. The psychopaths still exist. They're the psychopaths yeah. in power. And also the um, alpha male is the street criminal, the predatory criminal. So they're not gone. They're in abundance. But the so-called civil society male completely fucking pacified as far as I've seen. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not generalizing for all, but the majority is all part of a, of a reason for something else, you know? And that is put society in a, a vulnerable um, place. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so with that said, I mean, we're, we're you should be honored to be alive during these times because history is being made. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Historically, this is a real time to be alive. But I'm damn sure, I mean, I've got three granddaughters and I want to be out of sight them. When they say to me, granddad, what did you do during this period of time? I want to say, well, I fucking try to wake out as many people as I could using the platform that I got. Because here's what I believe, right? There's many things in, in life that I'm fucking shit at. But <laughs> violence I'm good at. Yeah. I hate violence, but I'm fucking good at it. <laughs> but what I'm also good at is enlightening people to methods of counter violence and understanding you know so i'm a, i know i'm a good teacher to the point where i don't believe it's me i believe something is working through me the vessel in the vehicle and i believe that the reason for that is is because um you know i'm a light worker i'm i'm here to wake people up and my platform just happened to be one that attracted many hundreds of thousands of people but predominantly men of an age of from 20s into their late 30s that potentially struggled with who they were mm -hmm. and with confidence in their ability yeah. to and, and had, had fears and i've seen you know scared youngsters that used to get in trouble all the time because it followed them around turn into good men yeah. you know good, good good men that are teaching others and, and following and what's weird inside of that is when my awakening to the current situation came into vogue, it didn't enter my head for one split second not to speak about how I feel. Yeah. I didn't think for one split second, oh, I might lose subscribers. Or, oh, I didn't, it didn't enter my head. Now, I've got a, a, a 40 schools over the world, pretty much, study groups and schools. Headquarters is in Frankfurt, and in Frankfurt, one of the main instructors there is a business genius. And he was always trying to tame me with what I say and everything else, and I'm like, ah, oh, fuck that. Do you know what I mean? And when I came out with how I feel, probably about 12 to 15 total people left UC. They were actually... Oh, they left they left the um the instructor program that they happened to be in at that time but so many people came 
to to me saying, oh, I'm glad you're awake. Somebody that is, you know, sweet, something, something that I admire and I respect is, is awake as well. I'm not going mad. And I'm like, we'll just chat about it. You know what I mean? Because I just, I believe that there's a reason for that. And I believe that my, my I'm sent here during this period of great awakening to wake up as many fucking people as they listen. Yeah. And I have guided a lot of people to betterment in themselves and to be more confident human beings, which they translated into other areas of their life. So it's always been, uh, although a dark vehicle, uh, to a light place. And um, I also believe that that those that have no chance of waking up to, to what really is going on, when they do get their rude awakening, you know, I've got to really struggle. When yeah. people start yeah. to realise, um, I mean, a lot of your viewers who, who are not on the same page as what, we're talk- what I'm talking about here will, will probably think I'm nuts, but there'd be many people, when they realise that everything they've ever learned in a history sense is story, by television, tell lie vision, yeah, is bullshit. Yeah. Everything you've ever been told is a lie. And when you know, the older generation sort of realise that, it, it, it won't compute. And there'll be meltdown on many levels. And some people are just too classified to even possibly comprehend. But there'll be a many that are awake now and really struggling with it. And I believe that many of the people that are here to light work, if you like, will be here for that reason to help some of those through that. Do you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I really do believe that this phase in history is going to pass quicker than you think. And we will enter a better age. We will enter a better age. I really do feel that in my heart. I'm not thinking in my head. I feel it in my heart. Because, you know, I believe now, now I'm more of a spiritual being. I've been here a lot of times before i'm an old soul and this is my last time here and i volunteered to to be here mm. unbeknown you know and i'm here for a reason and i think that my vehicle it, it just everything fits always had that question i suppose everyone's got that question who am i yeah why yeah. the fuck am i here and what i've got to do and i don't mean who am i in this physical body who's lee morrison close call combat fucking you know whatever I mean, much, much deeper on a much, much higher, bigger level. What is the oh. highest? What's the highest version of myself? Mm. What does he look like? Because I want some of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And I know that when, you know, as my path trend ascends, you know, you know the martial vehicle will, will move away from me. Because that's like the, you know, that's the summit for any in, in the martial arts kind of. Um, traditional esoteric thinking is you start with the physical you transcend the physical you become understanding of your emotional and psychological self and then you become you, your spiritual summit will approach one of my closest friends jeff thompson was was the first person to experience this decades ago yeah. two decades yeah. ago and i can remember thinking yeah mate i'm never going to be born <laughs> Andy, that ain't ever going to happen. Yeah. And I am the same personality. I mean, you make me a cornered animal, I'll steal your fucking face. Yeah. You try to work mine, I'll end you. I'll end your bloodline. But I will always seek to, uh, uh, to to create great joy in my life and the people I'm around. Do you know what I mean? I would always seek to elevate yeah. your emotional yeah. state to one of a greater sense of well-being. You know, I'm much more likely to congratulate you and support you than I would give you resistance. Yeah, for sure. Poor creature. Do you know what I mean? I, I do believe I'm a great magician. I'm capable of both sides, but I choose calm and peaceful all day long. So, yeah, that's the new evolution to you see then. It's more of a non-physical kind of shows a different side to it. Because everybody, all, everything they've always they've seen is, is they think, oh, he's a thug. <laughs> and then there was a period where they went, mm, he's an educated thug. <laughs> yeah, he's a clever thug. Now there, there'll be that. Well, you know, there's no front and out of back. Yeah, yeah, he's he's bad, capable of bad, but equally capable of good, or more so. Amazing. Well, like, you know. I stroke little puppy dogs, cry at sad films, I love kids, and I'll help old ladies across the road where they want to fucking go or not. <laughs> Got no choice, yeah. And a rom-com will get you. 
<laughs> Amazingly, yeah. thank you. Such yeah. an, an articulate, you know, way of putting things and such a way, an in-depth knowledge, obviously, of real world violence. So thank oh, you so much. Use what you like. I'll use it all, mate. It's all gold. Yeah. All right, last one. Good to Perfect. meet you. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, take care and then hope to see you soon. Yeah, yeah. physically. Anytime, anytime. All right. Take care. Thank you.